But in our previous lecture on church history, I had a different handout, and I wanted to... What, what happened is we were talking in our last one about defining orthodoxy and how the church had a series of six ecumenical councils from 325 A.D., up uh, into the 600s, actually. There were six ecumenical councils, and these were basically for the purpose of settling disputes over theology. Uh, the early disputes were about the nature of Christ. Uh, one of the major disputes that arose that is still a dispute is over the deity of Christ, a principle uh, antagonist to what would now be considered the orthodox, orthodox view of Christ, was a man named Arius, and Arianism is named after him. And uh, his view was exactly that of the Jehovah's Witnesses today, that Jesus was a created being, uh, the most important and the most lofty of all created beings, and the first of the created beings, but not God, that he is not equal to God and not eternal with God, uh, but that he had a beginning, just like the angels and, and all created things had a beginning. This uh, did not set well with... Uh, Athanasius, who was a presbyter in the church of Alexandria, and there's a great dispute that arose. Both of them were eloquent proponents of their viewpoints. Uh, Athanasius promoted the view that it has come to be regarded as orthodoxy today, the Trinitarian view, or at least the view that Jesus was co-equal with God. And uh, really the whole church throughout the empire began to divide over this question. So finally Constantine, the emperor, concerned about a rift in the empire, which, by the way, was officially a Christian empire, and therefore a rift in Christianity was a rift in the political empire as well. He called for the first ecumenical council at Nicaea, and out of that came the Nicene Creed. And the views of Athanasius prevailed, and therefore we are today Trinitarians, although uh, Athanasius didn't remain in favor perpetually because after Constantine died, his uh, son... The next emperor actually was an Arian and banished Athanasius from the empire, although he was the great hero of the Nicene Council. He was the, the bad guy in the view of the, of the following emperor, and later emperors and leaders that would rise up would either favor the, what had come to be called and is now called the Orthodox view, and others would favor the Arian view. So there were for some centuries there was quite an influence of Arianism. In fact, one of the greatest evangelists among the Goths that we'll talk about in our talk tonight was an Arian in his theology, and most of the Goths that were evangelized by him became Arians. Now today, because uh, of our, our basic commitment, the commitment of the whole church to the views of the Nicene Creed, we would think it a great tragedy if a whole continent was converted to an Arian form of Christianity. We call that today Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, we, we consider that a cult. But in those days, orthodoxy was not as as well established, although the ecumenical council decided that Athanasius was correct and Arius wrong, there were still many who attended that council and many who did not attend it, leaders in the church who were still convinced that Arius was right. So uh, the matter was not really settled for a very long time. And while Arius was condemned as a heretic, it's not necessarily the case, in my opinion, that, that all the people who were Arians uh, were rebels against truth, you know, or rebels against orthodoxy. Um, their view was came up before this, this, this decision was settled, and it wasn't easy for all of them to change their minds. Uh, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses have a little different background in that they came up after the doctrine of the Trinity had become well established in the church, and they simply rejected it again on the same basis as Arius did, and there's still, of course, a great deal of controversy over it. There were also controversies over the humanity of Christ and whether Jesus had one nature or two natures and whether he had one will or two wills. And one thing I pointed out in our last lecture is that as the church ceased to be persecuted, it seemed to have or feel that it had the luxury to become more petty about things. And uh, I'm not saying that some of these decisions don't have some weight. Certainly the decision of whether Christ is God or not God is an important decision. But when you get on to the question of did Jesus have two wills or one will and, and uh, you know, to what degree was his human nature subordinated to his divine nature or his divine nature subordinated to his human nature or whatever, uh, these are issues that it, it's hard to imagine Jesus would have ever even brought them up as important issues to discuss with his disciples. Uh, if he ever did show a concern about such issues, he, they're not recorded in Scripture. Uh, 
And while it is always fascinating to gain a more precise view of Jesus or of the truth of Scripture, uh, my own take is that a lot of these issues, uh, even, even those that were wrong, were not wrong in such a way as to prevent them from loving the Lord or being saved in the sense that the apostles were saved when Jesus was here on earth. We, I don't know that the apostles had sorted all these issues out among themselves in their lifetime. I don't know that the issues that were issues to the church after the conversion of Constantine and the cessation of persecution of Christians, those issues, those petty things, it seems to me relatively, I don't know that they were issues enough for the apostles even to discuss them or concern themselves with them. And therefore, I'm not sure that agreement on every one of those issues that were decided is uh, really essential. In fact, some of the issues were decided on political grounds, largely, uh, because of rivalries between the Alexandrian Church and the Church of Antioch, or some other rivalry. And, uh, you know, one bishop was more powerful than another, and his, his schools prevailed. Uh, so there's still room for some disagreement with some of these issues, uh, though not all of them. All I can say is that when it gets down to deciding did, you know, Adam have a belly button or did Adam not have a belly button, you know, which actually was never really discussed at any of the ecumenical councils, to my knowledge. Uh, I mean, obviously, one view is correct and the other is incorrect. And it, there's always some sort of person out there who thinks it's important to know and important to excommunicate everyone who doesn't agree on whatever the correct view would be proven to be. And it seems to me that the church became more and more petty and concerned about hair-splitting issues. Now, I personally think on all of the issues that they discuss at these councils, I have an opinion. I have an opinion of who is right and who is wrong. But I don't really see how my opinion should be pressed on everybody else as if being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, depends on their agreement on some of these issues. Anyway, the last controversy that we discussed in our last session was that between Pelagius and St. Augustine, or Augustine, as you can pronounce it either way, I guess. I'm not sure which is correct. Pelagius, I introduced this briefly at the end of the last time, but I wasn't able to get into it as much as I would like to have. Pelagius was a British monk, and he migrated to North Africa, where Augustine was, the bishop of uh, North African city of Hippo. And uh, there he came into conflict with Augustine, and not only with Augustine, but with almost all the Orthodox Christians, uh, of which Augustine was one of the champions. Pelagius taught some things that Christians have not really taught much since the time that he was here. Um, he taught, for example, that sin, the sin of Adam didn't affect anybody but Adam. Now, of course, all of you, I'm sure, know of some other doctrine than that, that uh, when Adam sinned, it affected the whole human race in one way or another. There are differences of opinion as to exactly what way it affected us. There are some who believe that the sin of Adam conferred guilt on all the race automatically because we were in him, we sinned in him, and therefore every newborn baby is born guilty of what Adam did. That's the view of, uh, uh, of most Orthodox people. Uh, on the other hand, there are some who, like myself, question whether the Bible teaches such a thing as that. But we do believe that Adam's sin did affect the race in this direction of fallenness. That is, uh, though I don't personally believe that the Bible teaches anywhere that the, a baby is born guilty of Adam's transgression. I do believe that the Bible teaches that babies are born with a tendency to sin, with what we call a sin nature. Now, Pelagius denied both of these things. Pelagius not only denied that babies are born with the guilt of Adam's sin upon their record, he also denied that they had any propensity more towards sin than toward righteousness. They were, man is born neutral, just like Adam was before his fall. Uh, that was Pelagius' position, that Adam's sin only affected Adam, and all people that have been born from Adam since that time have been born into a condition identical to that which Adam was in before his fall. Uh, obviously, that view is no longer held widely um, in the church, but it was uh, fairly widely accepted among Pelagius' disciples in the days in the early 5th century. Uh, he also taught that all men sin as a result of bad example of Adam and of society. They don't sin because of an innate tendency to sin. They sin because uh, they're influenced by the temptations of a corrupt society and of Adam's bad example. Uh, I have never quite understood how this argument could be pressed 
because society is just people. And if people don't sin until society influences them that way, then it's hard to know exactly how society came to be evil when the people in it were basically not evil. I mean, that, it, it, there probably is an answer that Pelagians gave that was sensible to them, but I, it's always seemed peculiar to me that people say men are all born naturally neutral, but society is innately corrupting when it, society is just basically people. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not here to... I guess I am here to comment on these views, but I mainly want you to know what the views were that he taught. He also taught that man can choose to do right and even live a sinless life without special aid from God. Now, this was not, it should not be thought that Pelagius was denying that we need the grace of God. He just believed that everyone has the grace of God. He believes that God's general grace is given to all men to choose what's right. And, uh, and therefore, they don't need any special um, favors or assistance from God to choose what's right. And, of course, this differs very much from what Augustine taught, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, Pelagius taught that grace is an enlightenment of man's reason by which God seeks to assist man in making right choices and uh, that man can cooperate with God or not in that. Also, he taught that physical death is not a judgment upon sin, but it's just a natural result of being physically alive. Uh, it's part of the life cycle. You're born, you live, and then you die. Animals do that, and they don't sin. And uh, so Pelagius taught that human death is not really a punishment for sin. It's rather just a process. It's just part of the process of having lived. You live, and then eventually your body wears out and you die. Now, none of those views are held as orthodox today by mainstream Christians. I suppose that last viewpoint was in order to explain infant innocence, because, innocent, because infants die, too. There are babies who die. And I have read Calvinist authors, and Calvinist, of course, the opposite of Pelagian. We'll talk about Calvin eventually, but Augustine is the father of Calvinism, as we'll see. The debate between Pelagius and Augustine really crystallized the views that later came to be known as Calvinism. But uh, I have read Calvinist authors who argue that the fact that babies die and the fact that death is a punishment for sin, that is, it's not natural, it's penal, uh, it's, uh, the wages of sin is death, proves that babies are born guilty because God penalizes them sometimes and they die the penalty of death and that proves that Adam's guilt is transmitted to them. That is a Calvinist argument. That probably arose in the debate between Augustine and Pelagius. So Pelagius said, well, no, the fact that babies die has nothing to do with them being sinful. It's not a judgment on them. It just has to do with the fact that bi the biological systems sometimes don't work right, and eventually they stop working. And so that was the Pelagian view, and it was fairly widely held. Now, most of us, myself included, would find ourselves in disagreement with Pelagius on maybe all of those points, at least some of them, maybe all of them. But it shouldn't, we shouldn't judge Pelagius too harshly uh, and I say that only as a rebuke to my own attitude formula. I once, uh, many years ago, almost 20 years ago, was in a debate with a Pelagian, a modern Pelagian. And uh, I, thought, I thought he was such a heretic. Uh, well, the particular individual I debated with was a very immature person, and it was not easy to think of him as a, a brother anyway. But uh, I tended to think of his uh, defects in terms of his bad theology, and I tended to think very harshly of his theology. I have since met modern Pelagians who strike me as people who love the Lord and they love the scriptures and they just understand it differently than some of us do and and I, I really can't condemn them to tell you the truth. I might I might still say I disagree with them. I might still condemn the viewpoint, but I, I am certainly not in the position to say that a person could not hold Pelagian views and still be a brother in the Lord. Now in the days of these councils, the church wasn't all that gracious toward whoever was the loser in the controversy. Whoever won, his views became orthodoxy. Whoever lost was banished from the empire if he kept, unless he changed his views. And, uh, and so there wasn't a lot of grace for differences of opinion so that an increasingly narrow set of viewpoints decided by these councils became considered orthodoxy. And 
uh, to a certain degree, uh, I think most of us would agree with the views that became orthodoxy, but it should be understood that when we think of those who opposed what is now considered to be the orthodox view, they were not necessarily criminals against God. They were people who sincerely, in many cases, believed that they were upholding what the Scripture taught as they understood it. It's just that their views lost the debate and they got condemned and branded as heretics. And uh, unfortunately for them, the church didn't have room for more than one opinion on things. And the person who won the debate against Pelagius was Augustine. And Augustine taught, and obviously in reaction against Pelagius, that all men sinned in Adam and are born corrupted by a sin nature and guilty of Adam's transgression at birth. Thus, man is unable to choose to do good or to be saved apart from God's grace. That is, because of the corruption that is in man at birth, he does not have the power to choose what is right unless God puts it in him to do so. Faith and perseverance, according to Augustine, are gifts that God unconditionally gives to those that he's chosen for salvation. This is, of course, the doctrine that Calvin taught also, and we usually call it unconditional election. And finally, Augustine taught that salvation is thus from, from beginning to end all of God. Now, you can see that Pelagius' views tended to glorify man and man's ability to do what's right without needing an awful lot from God. And therefore, Pelagianism is viewed as a man-glorifying system. In reaction to that, Augustine, I think rightly disagreeing with Pelagius, may have pendulum swung in reaction. Now, of course, there, a modern Calvinist would say Augustine didn't pendulum swing. He just came right on the mark because what Augustine taught is what modern Calvinists teach to the letter. Calvin himself admitted that nothing he taught could not be found in the writings of Augustine. Uh, so in calling Calvinism Calvinism, we're really using a misnomer. Calvinism is really Augustinianism. And Calvin simply popularized it at a, you know, a, about... A thousand, a thousand years after Augustine. And so these views were in tension, and the church sided with Augustine on it. And I personally don't agree with Augustine or Pelagius uh, on, on these particular issues fully. Uh, I would be what most Calvinists would call semi-Pelagian, but what most people who are more fair-minded call Arminian. <laughs> because Arminius was a guy who, uh, he was not Pelagian, and he was not Calvinistic. After a while, he was a Dutch theologian. We'll talk about him someday, weeks off from now. But Arminius taught things that were basically contrary to what Calvin taught. And Calvin has always called him semi-Pelagian because he's, you know, part of the way back toward what Pelagius taught from where Calvin is. But uh, I believe that both Pelagianism and Calvinism are extreme um, caricatures of what the Bible teaches on the subject. And that Arminius was not semi-Pelagian any more than he was semi-Calvinist. He's, you know, he was halfway somewhere in between in the sense of, I believe, just finding the middle biblical road without extremes. But, of course, that's my own opinion. And everyone has their own. But as a result of this debate, and, and as often happens in debates, people who would be otherwise moderate on a position become extreme on a position in polarization against their opponent. And uh, that's what happened. And the church sided with Augustine. And for some time afterwards, the church was very much Augustinian and still is to a large degree. Um, Pelagius was condemned several times. He was condemned by a synod at Carthage in 412. And then he was later condemned by Pope Innocent in 416. And then he was condemned by a general council of African churches in 418. And finally, by the ecumenical council of Ephesus in 431. So the guy got hit and hit and hit and hit again. Eventually, uh, he was fully branded as a heretic. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, that's really a summary of the things we were talking about last time. I want to now talk to you about Augustine's influence in another direction and about some of the contemporaries of Augustine. Now, in, our, in these studies in church history, one thing I'm trying to do is, if possible, tell you the direction that the official institutional church developed as history progressed through the centuries because the official church got more and more strictly defined as the centuries went by. But my own position throughout is that the official institutional church 
is not exactly the same thing as the body of Christ. There is overlap. There are persons who are true members of the true church in the institutional church, and there are people who are not members of the true church in the institutional church. That is, the institutional church has some true Christians and some not true Christians. Likewise, there are true Christians outside the institutional church in more unusual or uh, less official kinds of gatherings, and there are non-Christians outside the church. So there are two spheres. There is the institutional church, and then there is the true body of Christ, and those spheres overlap so that you'll find members of the true body of Christ in the institutional church. But that doesn't mean that the institutional church is to be identified with the true body of Christ, which is the latter is defined in terms of spiritual experience and commitment, whereas the institutional church usually is defined in terms of confessional things. Do you confess to the creeds? If you confess to them and you say you believe them, then you can be in the institutional church. Uh, But uh, it takes more than just confessing to creeds to be saved. You have to love the Lord. You have to... You have to be regenerated. You have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to be a follower of Christ. Those are all things the Bible defines as part of being in the church. And so it's not identical. But I think it's important for us as we study through the centuries of church history to see that there was something happening in the official church and simultaneously there was stuff going on, not necessarily uh, in, in, you know, in, in the official church. Might have been linked with it in one way or another, but it was something that God was doing additional to and maybe in a different direction from the direction the official church was going. But Augustine was the most influential theologian in history. In my opinion, he has had more influence on the church than even St. Paul. I believe the Apostle Paul should have had more influence than Augustine, but unfortunately I don't think that's the case. I think in the institutional church, the church has followed Augustine more than they followed Paul or even than they followed Jesus. And uh, partly that's because he was the great hero of the big conflict with Pelagius. And he was a very eloquent uh, defender of Christianity. And, you know, one of the things that made Augustine pivotal in in his influence was that Rome fell to the Visigoths in 410 A.D. Now, that was not the final burning and, and overthrow of Rome. There were several waves of invaders that came to Rome over, over the course of the 5th century. The final one was in sometime, I forget the, the exact year, it was 476 or something like that. But in 410, the first of a series of barbarian invasions against Rome really took its toll, and, and Rome was captured by the, by the Visigoths and fell, basically. It was quite clear that Rome was no longer going to be the, the world power it had been. It wasn't dismantled and burned yet, but it was no. It lost its power, as the as the queen of the of, of the cities of the world, and many of the remember Rome and the Roman Empire were Christian, at that time supposedly. I mean, August, uh, Constantine, in the in 323, uh, and uh, had you know basically made Christianity semi-official, and Theodosius, a later emperor, had made it official. So when Rome fell, it was Christian Rome that fell to the barbarians. And many Christians wondered, you know, what does this mean? This is, the, this is God's kingdom. This is, you know, Christian Rome. This is God's city that has been destroyed. And there was a lot of discouragement, a lot of confusion, a lot of theories running around. Was this going to be the end of the world? They wondered, how does this fit into eschatology and the view of end times? And the man who really came up at that time to answer those questions was Augustine. He wrote a book called The City of God, where he said that Rome was the city of man, but the city of God is the church. And the city of man is doomed to fall, but the city of God, the church, is eternal. And uh, very uh, classic work, The City of God, one of, one of the most famous of Augustine's works. He did some other very famous works as well, of course. But it was because his book, The City of God, uh, provided a philosophy of history. It was, it was the first philosophy, philosophy of history ever written, as a matter of fact. And it was written by a Christian. So he, his thought, you know, filled a felt need that the church had at that particular time of crisis. And he became, you know, the great thinker and, uh, that everyone looked to in the church. 
So his views of the sort that we would call Calvinist views were fairly readily accepted by the church. But you know, Augustine also contributed to Roman Catholic thinking as much as he contributed to Calvinist thinking. He, um, he contributed to the establishment of the Roman Catholic understanding of the church and the Calvinist view of salvation. Those are the two main contributions in Augustine's theology to the, to, uh, to the body of Christ. One is he contributed a Calvinist view of salvation and a Roman Catholic view of the church. Now, most Protestants appreciate the fact that he formulated Calvinism because probably the majority of Christians are Calvinistic in their thinking. And they look to Augustine as a great, uh, you know, uh, theologian because of his Calvinist views. The Roman Catholics looked to Augustine the same way, not because of Calvinism, because Roman Catholics are generally not Calvinistic, but because of his views about the church. And he taught things that were very strictly Roman Catholic, and he did a lot to propel the notions of a particular Roman Catholic sort uh, about church and the need to be in the church. Now, to, to Augustine, when he said the city of God is the church, he was not speaking of the church as a spiritual fellowship of believers. He was speaking of the church as the visible organization of the Catholic Church. And that is one of the things that I think was not a, a positive development through Augustine. Uh, even before Augustine's time, about you know almost a century before Augustine, in 325, at the time of the Nicene Council, many Roman Catholic ideas had come to be accepted throughout the church and were pretty well ex accepted. Uh, one was the idea that the clergy were priests. Of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, the clergymen are called priests. Well, I don't know if it's just a difference in words to you, but the concept is very different. Uh, in the New Testament, there are no priests. Uh, there are priests in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, there were no priests in the church. There were apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. There were elders and deacons, but no priests. And the reason was simply this. You don't need a priest when there's no sacrifice to offer. You don't need a priest to officiate at an altar if there's no altar and no sacrifices. In the New Testament, all believers are spoken of as if they are priests, and the altar and the sacrifice we offer are spiritual. It says several times in the New Testament that we offer up spiritual sacrifices to God, and we are a kingdom of priests. So you don't need uh, certain officials or clergymen in the church to call themselves priests to officiate at some physical altar with a physical sacrifice. But as you know, the Roman Catholic Church does have a physical altar and a physical sacrifice. It's called the Mass. And every Sunday they offer the sacrifice of the Mass, which is the wafer and the, and the cup, which is offered as a, a reoffering of the body and blood of Jesus again. And this was an unknown phenomenon in the early church. The apostles knew nothing of that practice. Uh, there were no, no need for priests. But as soon as you, you know, start a, a, an offering again of a sacrifice, you need some kind of a priest to officiate at the altar. So by 325, there was already this development. I don't know, uh, you know all the things that contributed to it, but what had formerly been just a, 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 re, a society of spiritually minded people governed by older Christians called elders, had now become uh, a ritualistic religion that had an altar and a sacrifice and needed priests to officiate at it. And so the clergymen in the church by that time were already thought of as priests. Also, the ruling bishops, there were still bishops, but they were not like the bishops in the New Testament. The bishops in the New Testament were simply uh, another word for the elders. Elders and bishops are terms that are used interchangeably in the New Testament. And in every church, there were several elders. The Bible says that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in every church. And you'll consistently, whenever the New Testament speaks about the elders or the bishops, it always speaks plural, elders or bishops of the church. And each church had several. But in by 325, and even considerably earlier than that, in the second century, there were already the ideas of bishops, certain individuals called bishops who were rising above elders, you know, and instead of them being interchangeable terms for the same guys, there were still elders or presbyters, but there were certain guys elevated above them in a political sort of way called bishops. And that, that's the rise of what's usually called the monarchial bishop, a bishop who had a sort of a kingly role, a ruling role. That's why they're called monarchial 
um, there was already in 325 the Catholic view of apostolic succession. If you're not familiar with that view, that is the view that the apostles, when they died, conferred an authority like their own on other men who became their successors. And when those men grew old and, and before they died, they conferred the same authority on successors and so forth on down the line so that right up until the present, according to the Roman Catholic Church, the leaders of the church, the College of Bishops and the Pope, are, have the same authority the apostles had in the early church. And therefore, their decisions are normative for the church. You see, whatever the apostles in the first century said or wrote in their letters became normative, became scripture for us. And the idea of apostolic succession holds that every generation of Christians has had apostles, as it were, persons whose opinions are normative for the church and that all people need to believe them or else be in rebellion against God. That view is already in place before Augustine and also the view that the bishop of Rome had some form of priority over the other bishops of the other churches and therefore not only was a monarchical bishop of that city but uh, sort of a bishop of the bishops, one that other bishops of other cities would, look, would uh, come to and, and defer to in some way. And this view arose because it was said that Peter was the chief apostle among the twelve and that he was the first bishop of Rome and therefore whenever anyone sat on the, the throne, as it were, the bishop of Rome in any age, they were the spiritual successor to Peter, the first bishop of Rome, and therefore had priority over the other bishops. None of this, of course, has any support in the Bible at all. None of it finds support in the teaching of Jesus or any of the apostles. Now, that is, of course, controversial because the Roman Catholics do use certain verses of Scripture to try to establish these points. But I dare say that people who use Scripture alone and not church tradition to determine what's true would never see those meanings in those verses that they use. In other words, you come up with the idea first and then you have to find it in the Scripture and try to shoehorn the verse into the concept. You would never arrive at that concept simply from reading the verses. And it's on that basis that I say that these ideas don't have the support of Scripture. But they do have the support of very early church tradition. And for those who think that church tradition has the same weight as Scripture, and Roman Catholics, that is their official position, uh, of course, then it carries the same weight as if it were in the Scripture. Now, all of those Roman Catholic-like ideas were already somehow introduced and fairly agreed upon before the Nicene Council. So the good guys and the bad guys at that council would have all agreed on all those Catholic ideas. But Augustine introduced some more ideas that have become pretty much normative in the Catholic Church today. He taught that the church is not a spiritual communion of believers, but it's the visible ecclesiastical organization of Catholicism. That's what the church is. Outside of that church, he taught, no one could be saved regardless how great their personal faith or the holiness of their life is. So, salvation under Augustine's teaching ceased to be an individual matter of a relationship with God that you personally can have because you believe in God. Like Abraham believed in God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Or David. Or any other person throughout history that has known God by personal faith and by a living relationship. That's what the early church taught and what the Bible seems to teach about salvation. But Augustine taught, no, you have to be part of this ecclesiastical organization. You may have great faith and great holiness, but if you're on the outside of this organization, you're not saved. So this began to redefine salvation for him. Now, he wasn't the first to say that, but he's, he basically made that official through his influence. He also, uh, based on the words of Jesus in Luke 14, 23, where Jesus said, compel them to come in in the parable of the bridegroom and the feast and uh, you know the guests were not coming in uh, on their own and, and so the messengers were told to compel them to come in. Based on that scripture, Augustine said it was okay, though not real desirable, but nonetheless okay to use physical force, the sword, for example, to compel conversions. That is, to make people come into the church if they were reluctant at the point of the sword or, or through force. Now, he believed it was much better to do so by persuasion 
But he did sanction the use of physical force to make converts. In this, of course, he set in motion uh, a very terrible trend, which in later years the Roman Catholic used with deadly cruelty because the Spanish Inquisition and the Crusades and many other horrible abominations arose out of that same philosophy that if they won't convert on their own, kill them, you know, or, or, or coerce them. And that simply isn't agreeable at all with anything that the New Testament teaches. In fact, it's quite contrary to it. It is not right, it is not even possible to cause someone to become a true believer in Jesus Christ because their life depends on it and if they don't convert, you know, they're going to be killed. Uh, they may, you can get them to say the right words, but you can't really get their heart to change. That change must come by conviction of the Holy Spirit. God has to be drawing the sinner in order for him to be uh, converted truly. But, of course, once you've decided that the Roman Empire is Christian and anyone who's not a Christian is therefore not really loyal to the ideals of the empire... Therefore, a non-Christian or a heretic is considered to be a traitor to the empire. And then, of course, capital punishment, which is always right for traitors, according to most laws of most lands, uh, becomes the appropriate thing to use on heretics. And, and for about a thousand years after Augustine's time, the church had its uh, in inquisitions and so forth by which it uh, killed and tortured many, many people whose views did not agree closely enough with the official party line. And uh, that has to be traced back to Mr. Augustine. And he's going to have to wear the responsibility for that before God for a long time, maybe forever. He also promoted the Catholic belief in the authority of tradition as equal to the authority of Scripture. That is, that the, what the ecumenical councils decided what held the same authority as if Jesus had said it, or Paul or the apostles had written it. Now, of course, this is a view that the Roman Catholics hold today, but Protestants generally don't. It's one of the distinctives between Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, Protestants believe that the Scripture alone holds ultimate authority as the Word of God, and that councils of men can sometimes be mistaken. And you can't always you know, judge orthodoxy by what a council of bishops decides, because they may have their own personal agendas, and they may not be inspired. But the Bible is inspired, and uh, therefore the scriptures alone are the rule of faith and practice. Uh, he also taught and enforced the doctrine of purgatory and the efficacy of the sacraments. Now, this is a very strange thing, because the doctrine of the sacraments, taught by Augustine and uh, the Roman Catholic Church ever since, is that salvation or grace, actual grace, is conferred through doing certain rituals when you're baptized or when you take the Mass or when you do certain other things, they're called sacraments. It's thought that by doing these actions, a special grace comes to you and that salvation is partly uh, conferred through the sacraments, faith and the sacraments. And penance and some of these other things are considered to be part of the necessity of salvation. Now, that, unfortunately, for the church... Uh, for a thousand years, all Christians were taught that this is true. And it is still held by many Christians to be true. And uh, that is the Roman Catholic position. It's strange that Augustine would say this because he himself had a dramatic conversion that was strictly by the grace of God. He was, a, he was an immoral young man uh, living in uh, fornication and so forth when he got converted. And he got dramatically converted and changed and became a monk. And none of that happened through the use of sacraments. He was saved by the grace of God alone. In fact, his doctrines of salvation are very Calvinistic. About it, you know, we were saved by grace alone. And yet, his doctrines of the church teach that the church alone could administer the sacraments. And without being attached to this church, you can't receive the sacraments or be saved. Uh, for years afterwards, and even till this day in the, in the Catholic communion, uh, if you, the worst thing the church can do to you is excommunicate you, which is cut you off from the sacraments. If you can't keep, if you're not welcome at the sacraments, you can't be saved, according to the Catholic view. And if the church doesn't want you there and says, okay, we disapprove of you so thoroughly that we excommunicate you, it means you're not a communicant at the sacraments. You can't come, and therefore you can't be saved. The church holds that power in Catholic thinking.
And also Augustine uh, believed in and enforced the use of relics. A relic is an old thing that had some imagined sacred value, perhaps as something to lift one's faith or whatever. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church in later years would sell relics. Splinters, alleged to be the splinters of the cross, were sold. It is said that if you could recover all of the splinters, alleged to be from the cross that the Catholic Church sold, uh, you could build a skyscraper with it. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, the, the toenail clipping of Peter or something like that, the eyelash of, of uh, Mary or something, would, would have some kind of special um, I don't want to say magical power because they'd object to that use of that word, but that's what it sounds like to me, uh, that it has some special way of uh, bringing special blessing. Almost it seems like a, uh, a magic uh, charm or something. Uh, I'm sure that the Catholics don't think of it exactly in the way that uh, I'm using the term magic charm, but to a large degree it's hard to tell the difference. Anyway, these are beliefs that Augustine introduced. So Protestants like Augustine because of his Calvinism. And Catholics like Calvinism, uh, Augustine because he, was, he contributed to the Roman Catholic theology more than any man prior to his time and probably since that time. Now, that's the direction the official church took under the guidance of Augustine and those who agreed with him. In Augustine's time and shortly before it, there were some very important movements that were sort of independent of what the official church was doing. I'm not saying that these people had no contact with the official church. In many cases, the people I'm talking about were bishops and, and involved, but they were not going the same direction as the official church. Some of them left bishoprics in order to pursue the call of God in their lives. And I want you to become acquainted with four of them tonight. I've given you mention of them in the notes. These people were all roughly... Uh, contemporary with Augustine, a little, some of them a little bit before him, but their life spans overlapped his. Um, a very relatively unknown fellow in church history, but very significant, was Ulfilus. Uh, Ulfilus lived from 311 to 383, and he is sometimes called the Apostle to the Goths. Now, one reason we don't hear too much of Ulfilus probably is we don't hear much about the Goths. They don't exist anymore, and uh, there's some ancient uh, ethnic group that we don't have any, you, you never hear about them in the news, you know. Nothing's going on in, in Gothic lands anymore because there are no Goths. But, uh, of course, the Goths were a major race of the barbarians that were outside of the Roman Empire. And Ulfilus evangelized them. He himself was born among them uh, north of the Danube River. And in his teenage years, he was sent to Constantinople uh, to study, and at age 30, he was consecrated as the Bishop of Constantinople. That was in the year 341. So he became a bishop there. Now, remember, Constantinople was sort of the, it was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Rome was the capital of the, Nor of the Western Roman Empire, and Rome actually fell, uh, not in his lifetime, but shortly afterwards, but the Eastern Roman Empire lasted much longer with Constantinople as its, as its uh, capital. So the church in Constantinople was a very significant church. It would be sort of like a church in Washington, D.C. today. Um, he was the bishop there, and uh, he retreated from that position and left the position of his bishopric there to go back to Cappadocia, uh, where he had come from, and to minister among his own countrymen. Now, he was a goth himself, and his first language was Gothic. But also through his education, he had learned Greek and Latin. And he's probably the first man who did what the Wycliffe Bible translators do today. He went back to the Goths, and the Gothic language had never been reduced to writing. It was just a spoken language, like many tribal languages today in uh, many tribal peoples. And uh, you're probably familiar with what Wycliffe Bible translators do. They go into someplace like that. The language doesn't exist in writing. And so they learn the language verbally, then they find, they, they, they find some characters, or they either borrow characters from existing languages or make up some of their own to represent the sounds. And then they teach the people how to read their own language, and then they translate the Bible into their language so they can read the Bible. It's a very long process. I think the typical Wycliffe Bible translator spends 
20 to 30 years uh, on the field doing this. It takes a very long time. Well, that's what Ulfilis did with the Goths. And that was sort of his life's work during many of the years of his life. He, he reduced the Gothic language into a written form using... And then he translated the Bible from the Greek version into Gothic. And although that, you know, no one speaks Gothic anymore, and you can't really buy a Gothic translation anymore, yet museums do have uh, some scraps of the Gothic Bibles that he translated. But he was apparently the first to do that kind of a thing. Um, For seven years, he served as a missionary, very dedicated among the Visigoths and the Goths, beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire, And he had tremendous success. Thousands of people were converted. So much so that the pagan chief of the Visigoths was threatened and began to persecute and slaughter the Christians, the converts, in large numbers because they were coming to Christ and they wouldn't renounce their faith and many martyrs were made. At that time, because his converts were suffering martyrdom in large numbers, uh, Uphilus got permission from... Constantine, the emperor, to move a great body of these Christians from Gothic lands into what would be today Bulgaria. I'm not sure how it was pronounced back then, Moesia. And uh, that was within the Roman Empire, and therefore uh, there'd be protection from these Gothic chiefs that were killing them. So here we have a, a, a precedent for Christians in mass leaving their homeland in order to live in another country because persecution was so great. This kind of thing happened later in church history many times. Many times persecution has driven whole Christian communities out of their own land into another country. And we'll read of some of the interesting cases of those as we go through church history, but that's an early instance of it. Uh, Ulfilis wasn't really officially a monastic. He's a little early to be uh, really in the monastic movement, but his lifestyle was very similar to monastic lifestyle, living ascetic and uh, kind of separate from the big city and so forth. He'd left the big city where he had been a bishop in order to evangelize these uh, rustic people on the fringes of the empire. He was really a pioneer missionary and a Bible translator. Now, he was Arian in his beliefs. He was not orthodox. And he did live, for the most part, after the Nicene Council. So he rejected the Nicene Creed. But he loved the Lord. And it's very hard to say that his converts, many of whom sealed their testimony with their blood, it's hard to say that they're not in heaven today just because they didn't share the Nicene beliefs. I personally disagree with his Arian beliefs. I believe he's wrong. But it's interesting that many influential Christians were Arians um, in the old, early centuries of the church. Another really important uh, Christian worker at that period of time, almost the same years, a little, just slightly different years of the lifetime of Ophelis was Martin of Tours. And Martin of Tours was influential in Gaul, which is, of course, modern France, in some of the same ways that Ophelis was among the Goths. Um, Now, Martin was born not in a Christian family, even though the Roman Empire was Christian, Not everyone was Christian in it. And his parents were not converts. They were pagans. And he was born in uh, Pannonia, which later would be known as Yugoslavia. And his parents, while he was still a youth, later moved to Italy, where his father served as an officer in the Roman army. Now, Martin didn't really want to join the army. And there's some uh, different things I've read. Some books suggest that he had become a Christian already before he was 15, Uh, I don't know how he became a Christian since his parents were not saved, but perhaps in Italy uh, he encountered Christians there because officially Italy is Christian. Uh, But uh, it's not clear whether he became a Christian before or after he went in the army, but he reluctantly uh, went into the army when he was 15 years old at his father's, of course, encouragement, who was an officer. And there's a story told about Martin that on a particular day in winter, a cold winter's day in Amiens in northern Gaul, that he met a beggar. And uh, Martin took his own cloak and his sword, and he cut the cloak in half and gave half of it to the beggar. And that night he had a dream 
And in his dream, he saw Jesus wearing that half a cloak that he had given to the beggar. And uh, although I believe he had Christian beliefs before this time, he had not been baptized. Shortly after that time, he was baptized as a Christian, and he left the army. And uh, he went to France to be taught in the faith and become a clergyman, become a, a preacher. Now, he became a strong opponent of Arianism. And while he was contemporary with Ophelis, they labored in different areas. If they had met each other, there would have been a strong uh, disagreement among them because Old Felix was an Arian and Martin was anti-Arian, and strongly so. But uh, they both were very used of God in their own way of bringing people out of paganism and to Christ. In fact, uh, after he was trained, he went back to Italy. He had been trained in France. He went back to Italy where his mother was still living, and he converted her. Remember, she was a pagan, so he had the privilege of leading his own mother to the Lord. And that was just the first of many. Uh, he, the priest of Milan, or the bishop of M Milan, was named Occentius, and he was an Arian. And because Martin was anti-Arian, the bishop drove him out of Milan, which is in Italy. And so he returned to Gaul, or, or France, where he had been trained, and he established the first monastery in that country in 360 A.D. Now, from that monastery, Martin gathered young men, as disciples that he trained and influenced and led them and took them out in the countryside to witness to the country folk in the region of Tours, France, which is why he's known as Martin of Tours. Um, these country folk had largely been neglected by the church's evangelistic efforts before, and uh, they were scattered, so you know it was not a concentrated population, and they were not easily reached, but he and his companions... Uh, went out and had a tremendous impact on these country folk and led many, many people to Christ. And they, uh, you know, he, he was sort of, I mean, we don't know all the details, but I think if we lived in his time, we would have to say he was, uh, you know, leading, a, a, having a revival, you know. And hundreds, or if not hundreds of thousands, of people came to Christ through his influence and those of the people that he was leading around. Um, uh, he convinced multitudes to convert and he tore down the pagan temple in the city of Tours uh, which had been the official religion in Tours and he built a Christian church on the site where the pagan temple had been and uh, the dedication of his church was accompanied by exorcisms uh, he had to exorcise the demon from where the pagan temple had been and he did that and Tours became a Christian city he became the Bishop of Tours, although it was kind of against his will to do so. He was appointed uh, over his own protest in 372. And he personally, not just you know, by appointing and sending people out like a bishop might do, you know, he might sit in his ivory tower and send out missionaries, but rather than do that, he personally went out and evangelized uh, the previously neglected countryside. And many miracles are, att are attributed to him. His uh, ministry is believed to have been accompanied by miracles. Now, some church historians would speak of these as legends, and perhaps some of these are legendary. But see, most church historians don't believe in miracles after the times of the apostles, and, and so they probably just assume they're all legends. Uh, I assume that if there are stories of miracles accompanying this man's ministry, there's not really any reason to doubt that there were miracles. There might be some specific miracles that he didn't do that got added to the list, as legends, but it would appear there was a miraculous ministry uh, as well as an anointing in converting people. At the time of his death, most of the surrounding tribes had been converted by him and his followers. So while the church was developing in the, in the direction of Roman Catholicism, there were these guys sort of on the outskirts. Uh, uh, Martin became a bishop in the church reluctantly, Ulfilis had been a bishop and left that position. Both of them became monastics, as it were, and, and very evangelistic and had tremendous impact converting almost whole countries. Uh, Ulfilis among the Goths and Martin in Gaul among the French or Gaul, people of Gaul. Now, there's a real interesting guy had a, a tremendous impact in Spain. His name was Priscillian and... He is still regarded by many church historians as a heretic. 
But there's strong reason to question it because some of his writings have recently emerged, not too recently, last century emerged. Uh, and what he wrote does not sound very heretical at all. And it seems very possible that he's branded as a heretic by people whose views we would regard as her heretical. You know, I mean, he, what he actually taught was very contrary to what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching in his day. But not very different than what Martin Luther taught. And uh, if Martin Luther had lived in his day and had been executed as Priscillian was, Priscillian became the first Christian to be martyred for, uh, or to be executed as a heretic. But uh, the Catholic Church would have liked to have executed Martin Luther as a heretic, too. But many of us would not call him a heretic uh, because we have a different position we come from than the Catholic Church. It's possible had we known Priscillian, we might have been on his side of the controversy also. Priscillian did not become a Christian until he was an adult. He was a rich Spaniard, and he was well-educated and a very eloquent speaker, a powerful speaker, had tremendous influence on people. He studied philosophy initially, but he was disenchanted with philosophy after a while, and um, he eventually converted to, to Christianity. And he began to give Bible studies. He just began to expound on the Bible and give practical application of how people should live according to Scripture. His views, however, were very different than those of the Roman Catholic Church and got himself into trouble. He led a real popular movement, and he was a layman. He was not a bishop initially. And many people were converted by his preaching and by his practical expositions, and his followers came to be called Priscillians, although they just called themselves Christians. It was their rivals and their enemies that called them Priscillians. After him, Priscillian. But they, they are known to have only called themselves Christians. And he was appointed bishop of the Church of Avila in Spain, but uh, the Spanish clergy generally didn't like him. Something he was teaching really bothered them. They accused him of Manichaeanism. Now, Manichaeanism, we studied in an earlier lecture, was started in Persia by a guy named Mani, who was more or less Gnostic and definitely a, a genuine heretic, who, I mean, in no sense was an Orthodox Christian. But once Manny was condemned and Manichaeanism was condemned, the Catholic Church often used that label to accuse people who were disagreed with them on almost any point because Manichaeanism uh, was sort of like saying Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or something like that today. It was just a, it was a label that would definitely immediately elicit a negative response from Orthodox Christians. And so he was, he was accused of Manichaeanism, although there's no real evidence from his writings that he ever taught Manichaeanism. He was accused of teaching dualism, which is a Gnostic idea, perfectionism, and he is accused of denying the humanity of Christ, which would also be a Gnostic idea. Now, Priscillianism was condemned, therefore, at the synagogue of Saragossa in 380, and Priscillian was banished from Spain. However, um, he did come back to Spain in 384, four years later, with an imperial appro approval from the emperor. And uh, the opposition was renewed against him at the Synod of Bordeaux, where Priscillian's opponents joined with the evil bishop Ithacus, accused him of heresy, immorality, and sorcery. Now, it's really hard to know what the basis of these charges was, because most of his writings have been stamped out, and he was called a heretic. And you've got to remember, the, the winners in the conflict write the history. Uh, the victors write the history. And in this case, uh, we find that he, was, he lost this controversy. And the Roman Catholic Church wrote the history about him. And it's hard to know to what degree the history is legitimate. Obviously, if Priscillian was guilty of heresy and immorality and sorcery, then there's every reason for the church to, to oppose him as it did. Although I don't think it was right for them to burn him uh, as they did, but uh, the fact is that it, he may not have been guilty of any of those things. What is known of his writings sound very unlike the accusations that were made against him. Well, he appealed, when he was accused of heresy by the Synod of Bordeaux, he appealed to the emperor, Maximus. But Maximus wanted to be on good terms with the Spanish clergy, 
who didn't like Priscillian, and so he approved of Priscillian's being executed. And Priscillian became the first Christian executed for heresy. I said he was burned, but he was actually beheaded with six others uh, who were also called Priscillians. It's a typographical error where it says Procillians there. Now, even though the Catholic clergy executed Priscillian and six others for heresy, there were other leaders in the church who disagreed with that decision. Among them, Martin of Tours. Martin of Tours protested the execution of Priscillian. Another person who did was Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, who is the one who led Augustine to the Lord, a very famous bishop, Ambrose. And these men believed that the Catholic clergy in Spain were wrong, and they opposed it. But uh, the king, wanting to please the Spanish clergy, went ahead and did it. So, I mean, the fact that Martin of Tours and Ambrose both opposed the execution of Priscillian raises serious questions as to whether his condemnation under these charges was more of a political thing by his local opponents or whether he really taught such things as that were really heresy. Anyway, Priscillian's writings after his execution were systematically sought out to be destroyed, and uh, mostly they were. Um, however, some were found uh, that apparently they didn't get. There were many people who, however, had been converted under Priscillian's preaching and still were loyal to him after he died. They were still called Priscillians and for a couple centuries. After his death, there were people uh, in Europe called Priscillians. The Emperor Maximus, who had him executed, was later overthrown and the popular sentiment of the public was in favor of Priscillian after his death. And Ithacus, the wicked bishop who was largely responsible for condemning him, was deposed of his position, but that didn't bring Priscillian back. But it may be that Priscillian was actually a very godly uh, revivalist and Bible teacher. His writings, some of them, were found in 1886. And some of the things he taught would definitely be considered heresy by the Catholic Church, but would not necessarily be considered heresy by you or me. For example, Priscillian taught that the Scriptures were the sole rule for Christian doctrine and behavior, whereas the Catholic Church taught that tradition held equal weight with Scripture. Priscillian didn't accept that. Priscillian taught that Christians must live a holy life, and that has to be the outflow of personal communion with Christ. In other words, he didn't believe that the sacraments are the basis of a relationship with God, but that a, a personal f fellowship with Jesus and a holy life was essential. The fact that he taught this very strongly makes it very doubtful that the accusations of his immorality and sorcery uh, were true accusations. Um, he also taught that the communion with Christ is entered through personal living faith in Christ. And he also taught that no spiritual distinction exists between clergy and laity. He believed that since all Christians have the Spirit of God, any might teach the Word. Of course, he was himself a layman when he began teaching the Word. He was later uh, made a bishop, but then executed. Um, so, Priscillian's a controversial character. But my impression from what little is known in his writings is that he was falsely accused of heresy, wrongly killed, and that he was just leading a real revival movement, leading a lot of people to Christ and making disciples in Spain, and it offended the Catholic Church because he did it in a different way than the way that they approved. The last person I want to talk about tonight is much better known by most of us, at least we know his name, because there's a day every year that the Irish celebrate in memory of him, and that is, of course, Patrick of Ireland, the Apostle of Ireland. Now, the dates of, Irish, uh, of Patrick's actual life are very controversial. Some of the sources I checked said he was born around 390 and there was no date given for his death. Uh, there's an, uh, other sources that say that some research has indicated he may have lived as much as almost a century later than the traditional date. So we don't really know for sure the exact date, but he was uh, uh, apparently his lifetime was roughly sometime in the 5th century, uh, around the same time as these other guys. His story is very interesting, and we, have, we know much more about Patrick than we do about some of these others because he wrote his own uh, testimony, his own confessions of his life, and uh, assuming his story to be true, and it probably was because he was a very saintly man, 
Um, very interesting guy. He was born in Britain with, in a Christian family. His parents were Christians. But he was kidnapped when he was a teenager. Uh, he was 16. And there were some raiders that came through Britain and took captives. He was one of them. And he was sold as a slave in Ireland. And he was out tending livestock for his owners on the hillsides for six years. He was, he was a slave there, had been kidnapped. He was a herdsman, sort of like David out on the hills. And it was although he had not paid much attention to his Christian, the Christian faith of his parents before this time, because he was taken captive and isolated and so forth, he drew near to God. And he began to have dreams and visions. And these dreams and visions began to really guide his life uh, in a big way. He was told in a dream at one point while he was out tending the sheep. After six years, he was told in a dream that there was a ship laying at anchor waiting to take him away back home to Britain. <coughs> and so he walked 200 miles uh, to, the, to the place that he dreamed of. And there was the ship ready to set sail. Initially, the captain of the ship didn't want to give him free passage to Britain, but he talked him into it, and so he did. He, he sailed to Britain and got to go home. Now, he didn't immediately get home to his parents because the, the ship landed in a part of Britain that was very uh, desolate, and there weren't many people, and there wasn't much to eat. And when they landed in Britain, both Patrick and the crew of the ship almost starved to death because of the lack of food. But Patrick prayed for food, and a herd of swine appeared, in the path before them, and they arose and killed and ate <laughs> and did not complain about the unclean food. Um, I guess what God has cleansed, they were not going to call common. Now, he managed after this to find his way back home to his parents. And his parents, of course, were very glad to see him alive. He'd be about 22 years old at that time. And they urged him to stay in Britain. Uh, but he really wanted to be in the ministry. And he had a dream one night. And in this dream, a man gave him a letter. And he opened the letter. And it said on it, the voice of the Irish. And as he read the letter in the dream, he heard Irish voices. And they were saying, we beseech thee, holy youth, to come and walk once more among us. And he believed from this dream that he was called to go back to Ireland, the land where he had been a captive and to evangelize there, because Ireland and the British Isles in general were not Christian in those days. They, they were pagan. Um, they had come under Roman political power, but they had not really converted to Christianity. There were some converts, by the way, in Britain, but they were of a Roman Catholic sort. But their, Ireland was still very much pagan and given over to Celtic religion. Uh, his elders in his church did not want him to go to Ireland, but he managed to go anyway, and he got himself ordained as a missionary bishop to the Irish, and he went over there. Now, the, the religion of the Celtic people in Ireland at the time, or the Celtic people, was polytheistic. They believed many gods. They believed in fertility. Uh, uh, it was a fertility cult, and therefore they were involved in sexual immorality as parts of their religious rituals, and they also practiced infant sacrifice which tells you, you know, how much he had his work cut out for him. But he ministered there among them for 30 years, and he never did return home to Britain. He spent the rest of his life in Ireland, uh, where apparently he died. Now, his ministry in Ireland was apparently very supernaturally charged. He had what we would normally call today power encounters with the pagan priests, duels of the mir miraculous and so forth. And I don't know all of the details of this, but quite a number of miracles are attributed to, to Patrick. In fact, there's a legend, maybe true, that the reason there's no snakes in Ireland is because Patrick got rid of them all, that uh, there, were, there were poisonous snakes in Ireland before he was there. But one of the miracles he did was, I don't know how he did it, I don't know if it was like the Pied Piper of Hamlin taking the flute and leading all the rats off a cliff, but uh, apparently Patrick is attributed with actually banishing all the serpents from Ireland. And many other miracles are attributed to him. Now, he was not well liked among the pagans who didn't convert. And he was attacked many times, beaten up by robbers and by other persecutors. He was also 
opposed by other clergymen of the Roman Catholic sort because he was more of a free agent type and did not seem to promote the Roman Catholic style of religion. And he experienced a great deal of uh, opposition in different ways. The Roman Catholic clerics often accused him of rusticity or being too rustic because he didn't have higher education. Uh, he argued that the reason he didn't have higher education was because during his teenage young adult years, he was a captive and he didn't have a chance to get an education, but he didn't feel like that should keep him from being in the ministry. And I would tend to agree with him since I don't have any higher education either. Uh, and a lot of people didn't, like the apostles, Jesus, uh, people like that. And they were yet nonetheless called to the ministry. Now, he was also accused by other clergymen of, of doing it for the money and having mercenary motives. But he said, in response to him, that he never took any money at all for the ministry from his converts, even sometimes offending his converts because he wouldn't receive gifts from them. Now, it's not known how he did survive, whether he just ate fruits and berries on the hillside or whether he was supported by the church in Britain that sent him out. Uh, that's a possibility. But in any case, he was not certainly exploiting his converts for money at all. Um, he claims that he spent the price of 15 slaves in bribing administrators and buying protection from kings. Apparently, his life was endangered so much by those who attacked him that he had to buy off kings and administrators to protect him and bribe them. Now, I don't know, if, I don't know how everyone here feels about paying bribes. I know that I've known people who are missionaries and go into foreign lands, and they, they simply refuse to pay bribes to officials, even though bribing... It's very fairly common practice. It's just against their Christian convictions. Um, it's you know the Bible certainly says it's wrong to take bribes, and if it's wrong to take bribes, it probably is wrong to give them. Although that's a, to give a bribe, depending on what you're hoping to do. To if you're hoping to taking bribes is to pervert justice. You know that's what the Bible condemns. The Bible condemns uh, a ruler who takes bribes because he does it to con to pervert justice. Uh, in a land where justice is not going to be done unless the officials are bribed, uh, the, the officials may be corrupt before God, but the person paying the bribe might be doing the right thing. I don't know. It's a, it's a hard call ethically there. But he, he paid bribes, he said, uh, to administrators and kings to protect him and, and so forth. That might not have been advisable from a strictly spiritual point of view, but perhaps if we were in his position, we might be strongly tempted to since getting beat up all the time and attacked. Um, he is the most successful missionary to the Irish, and therefore, of course, the Irish still celebrate him as the one who converted the island of Ireland. Uh, he approached chiefs and kings and got them converted eventually. He converted thousands of people. And he also was a monastic, but, but a different kind of monastic. He didn't follow a monastic lifestyle just as an end in itself. A lot of monastics did. They just thought being in a monastery was the epitome of spirituality. But he followed a monastic lifestyle for the purpose of training people in the word of God and of, uh, of just living an austere life to get the gospel out. Uh, in other words, not, not depending on a great deal of comforts for himself. He trained disciples. He traveled with them. And he left them to oversee the churches that he established. He was like a, a, an apostle to Ireland. He knew of God's mercy and grace, unlike some of the monks in different Roman Catholic monasteries. And he was not legalistic. He was a joyful guy, sang a lot. Uh, he believed that he was led by the sovereignty of God's providence. And he believed in the power of the gospel, which was uh, something the Roman Catholic Church was less and less emphasizing, the power of the gospel to save. And he also knew and quoted frequently the scriptures, judging by his autobiography. So we can see that while Augustine um, was taking the official church more in the direction that Roman Catholicism later took, there were on the outskirts of the ordinary church, sometimes even condemned by the, by the uh, official church, revival movements going on in various lands with Ulfilis among the Goths, Martin among the Gauls or the, the, the French, um, Priscillian among the Spanish, and Patrick among the Irish or the Celtic people. And so God was moving with these kind of um, 
offshoot guys who were not really in the mainstream at all of what the official church was doing. Some of them were heretics by definition uh, of the official church. But it's hard to know exactly to what degree we would, in hindsight, regard them as heretics because sometimes their views are much closer to ours than they are to the Roman Catholic Church, which is probably why they got themselves branded. Anyway, this takes us pretty much through what was going on in the 5th century. Uh, in the coming lectures, I'm going to want to talk to you about how the Roman Catholic papacy arose. And uh, I don't want to spend the proportionate time talking about the papacy that the number of years it lasted would warrant. We've taken a very long time just getting up through the 400s A.D., and, or even into the 400s, AD, into the 5th century in our consideration. But there were about a thousand years of the rule of the papacy that I don't want to spend the proportionate length of time on. It's too depressing. Uh, we will talk about it somewhat. We'll take a few sessions on it. But we'll cover that thousand years relatively quickly compared to the first 400. And then we'll come to the Reformation and we'll slow down a little bit and talk about some of the significant things there. Is it because I don't think anything significant happened during those thousand years? No, it's just too depressing, and uh, not very many good things happen. But there were movements, even during the Dark Ages, so-called, which were branded at the time as heresies and heretical sects, but were probably evangelical Christians by today's standards, as we would judge them. The Waldenses and the Albigenses and many others were there that, that were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church during those centuries. Um, and uh, the Inquisitions were largely directed against these groups but they were almost certainly Bible-believing Christians. They simply were on the outside of the institutional church, and that's what got them into big trouble. Well, we'll stop there uh, without belaboring this time period anymore, but we'll continue, as I say, to talk about the rise of the papacy in the official church and some of the resistance movements uh, that were probably what we call evangelicals today when we come next time.